That night our regiment fell back to the Luga River with a forced march, and by dawn we were crossing to the eastern bank of the river, in the area of Alexandrovskaya Gorka, covering the Kingisep Krikovo Road. After the eight days of fighting and the exhausting night march, many of the soldiers dropped to the still dew-covered ground and immediately fell asleep, as soon as they had reached the trenches. Sidorov and I were sitting on the edge of a ditch, not far from the highway. Romanov stood next to us, leaning against the trunk of an old birch tree. Peter's unshaven face, thickly covered with stubble, was sullen. That night, together with some radio operators who were tuning their sets, he had heard some German radio transmissions. The German radio was announcing, A three-day march remains to Moscow and to Leningrad less than that. Today our forces took the city of Kingisep and entered the outskirts of Leningrad. Romanov, squinting, was looking in the direction of the city of Narva, where fighting had continued all night long. Yershov and Grisha Streltsov were setting up their heavy machine gun in an open position near the road. From time to time they also intently gazed at the opposite bank of the Luga River, where we were expecting the enemy's appearance. You, Grisha, say that old friends are forgotten, Yershov spoke up. What, isn't that so? Streltsov replied, sticking alder branches into the ground in order to conceal the machine gun. No, and again no, Grisha, Yershov stated emphatically, while checking the full ammunition belts in the cases. Old friendships don't die. Vasily Dmitrievich Yershov was speaking about friendship enthusiastically and fervently, as if it was the loftiest human feeling. At that moment his eyes were shining brightly, and his face was literally transformed as he spoke. Akimov spoke up. Uncle Vasya, have you ever cried? I've cried, senior. Oh, how I've cried. It happened back in 1920, when the Whites killed my frontline friend. Yershov fell silent. The other soldiers began to busy themselves with their tobacco pouches. Prime movers clattered past us on the road, towing long-barreled guns. One truck after another, loaded with cases and barrels, rolled down the road, emitting clouds of blue exhaust. Cars slipped past us almost silently. Artillerymen were sitting in the trucks, on the gun carriages, even on the gun barrels. Their faces were gloomy, their uniforms smudged with grease and covered in road dust. They were our artillerymen, failing back from Kingisep to new positions. They were looking with concern back in the direction of the city, where large balls of fire were soaring into the ski and muffled explosions could be heard. They're burning the city, the vermin, Sidorov angrily whispered through his clenched teeth. Romanov glanced at the growing conflagration in Kingisep. My native town, he said grimly. The sun began to set. A chilly breeze was blowing in from the Narva harbour. No matter where you looked around you, there was not a single standing building. Everything had been burned or had collapsed, as if a hurricane had blown through here. But how dear was this scorched native land to me and my comrades? Our hearts were touched by each small withered shrub, each blackened stone and every scorched chimney. And I thought about the great courage with which these exhausted men, who fell fast asleep at any hour, or perhaps in the limited minutes just before a battle, were defending their land. The soft, rosy glow of the sun fell upon the cobblestone road, which stretched across the gently rolling terrain like a grey ribbon. Here and there it disappeared into small thickets, only to re-emerge on gentle slopes. Now the road was orphaned and empty of people. Major Chistyakov, with the regiment chief of staff, was checking our lines. Carefully stepping around the slumbering men, the officers attentively examined each bunker and firing position. The next morning, soldiers who had been defending King Isep began to approach our lines. A large group of Red Army men suddenly emerged from some woods and entered our lines. An officer was among them. Two red pips were visible on his dusty shoulder tabs. With a precise step, the lieutenant marched up to battalion commander Major Chistyakov and reported in a clear voice, Company Commander Kamalev, we defended King Isep to the last possibility. Kamilev fell silent and lowered his head. His combat friends were standing at attention next to the lieutenant. 
The stern faces of the privates and junior officers were begrimed with smoke and their eyes were reddened. Kamalev was around thirty years of age and well built. There was not a trace of timidity on his manly face. His grey eyes were open, penetrating and resolute. The order of the red banner was decorating the lieutenant's chest. He was holding a German machine pistol and had one of our Mosin 1891-30 rifles slung over his shoulder. I request permission, Comrade Major, to fight the Germans here together with you. I don't know where our headquarters is. I'll get in touch with the regiment commander to see if he'll authorise it, please. The battalion commander and chief of staff disappeared around a turn in the trench. We surrounded Kimelev and his men. Someone passed around a tobacco pouch. Rolling a cigarette, one short soldier exclaimed, Now this is a defensive line, as he surveyed his new surroundings with interest. Leningrad gals built these lines for us, Romanov said. Leningrad gals, the short soldier repeated, his eyes twinkling. What sort of little gift should we send them in return? He asked thoughtfully, puffing on his hand-rolled shag. What sort of gift for them? Let's toss the enemy from our land, then we'll bow low before them and tell them, Thank you, dears. Time will remember your work. That's our best gift, Romanov replied. We all fell silent for a spell. One of Kamelev's soldiers broke the silence. Hey, it'd be a fine thing now to get acquainted with your cook. To tell you the truth, we haven't had a bite to eat since yesterday. Sidorov shook his fist at him. No, brother, first you'll tell us why you abandoned King Isep to the Germans. Abandoned? What? Have you gone crazy? The soldier turned to the sergeant standing next to him. Comrade Commander, explain to him, please, or else he'll keep talking rubbish. Sergeant Rogoff, a husky man of middle age with a broad face and high cheekbones, scowled at Sidorov. You know... In the area of Kingisep and Sapsok, we beat back ten or eleven tank attacks a day, and if it hadn't been for the enemy air force, we wouldn't have retreated. The fascist vultures didn't let us breathe. Now, if we'd had better air cover, then things would have turned out differently. According to you, it seems, our pilots aren't doing anything, Sidorov retorted. They're flying, but we still have few planes. I pity them. They're dying right in front of your eyes. Rogoff waved his hand in annoyance. Eh, a few more planes and we'd show the Germans a thing or two. Neither tanks or assault guns are as frightening as air power. You can stick a grenade bundle under the tracks of a tank or assault gun, but just try to toss a grenade into a plane. Rogoff was silent for a moment or two, then continued. In the area of Ivanovsky, I encountered the commander of our forces himself. General Dukhanov, and asked him, Comrade General, where is our air force? Well, how did he answer you? Ulyanov quickly asked. What could he say? He squinted and looked up into the sky. The sergeant inhaled deeply before continuing. You say we retreated and abandoned the city to the Germans, as if we just let Hitler have it, our Soviet city, like we don't need it. Isn't that your opinion? Sidorov amicably laid a hand on the sergeant's shoulder. But all the same, brothers, you gave up the city, didn't you? Rogov's face flushed, and his Hazel eyes flashed angrily. He gazed directly into Sidorov's eyes, and in a firm voice retorted, And just how are you fighting? Likely, you were the first to flee from the Narva. We had orders. Ah ha ha! While we were driven out by force... Just stop and think. Who's right and who's guilty? Kruglov quietly listened to the argument. He knew that the troops were anguished over our failures and didn't want to intervene. But Kumilev turned on us and heatedly said, You think we don't know how to fight or are afraid to die? This is nonsense. Look, for example, on the left of our regiment, the 2nd People's Militia Division was fighting. Many of these men were untrained and poorly armed. They only had enough cartridges for two days. He stopped as if trying to recall something. Then he continued. A militia member, Petrov, was lying next to me in a shell crater. Before the war, he had worked as an engineer at the shipbuilding factory in Leningrad. 
When the German infantry attacked, Petrov met the fascists with grenades. As soon as the attack was beaten back, he quickly crawled out to a dead German and took his submachine gun and magazines. If only you had seen how his face was shinning. Now this is a different matter, he said. Just teach me, comrade commander, how to use this thing. When the German started coming at use again, Petrov fired the submachine gun, emptying one clip after another. Suddenly he stopped firing. I asked, what's happened? He replied, just a scratch on my right hand. It's nothing. I'll shoot at them with my left hand. Wounded, he continued to fight. Lieutenant Kamelev continued in admiration. Leningrad volunteers. What men? Knowing nothing about military tactics, they're blocking the foe's path to Lenin's city with bayonets and grenades. Then Kamelev shook his head. They say we're retreating because of our weakness. What weakness? If only we had more tanks and planes. Sidorov waved his hand in vexation. All right, guys, that's enough. You're embittered. Let's give you something a bit better to eat. We ate in the open trench. An enemy H's 126 reconnaissance plane was circling overhead, trying to spot our positions. Enemy artillery was sporadically shelling the highway. After the meal, one of Kamelev's men, Fadia, a stocky fellow about 25 years old, grabbed an accordion and took a seat on the edge of a trench shelter. He glanced around mischievously, and then started running his fingers over the two rows of keys. A young soldier came running out into the middle of the glade, gave his blonde curls a shake, raised a bowed arm above his head, waved it in the air and started to dance. The soldiers started to cry out, Volodya, let's have it! Fadia started to work the bellows, tapping his feet to the rhythm, and sang, It's Saturday today, you're my lady, you're my mom. The first line to an old, popular folk dance song. The sounds of the accordion drew an audience. Even our neighbours on the defence, soldiers of a people's militia battalion, came to listen, and among them were two young women with medical kits. One of them, with dark eyes and a kind, open face, plainly loved to dance, and she was tapping the toe of her unseemly large combat boots to the beat of the music. She was so light and lithesome that it seemed the slightest nudge would send her flying into the air like a feather. The militiamen began to shout, Get our Shura out here! Shura! The dark-eyed nurse. Shura, with the medical bag over her shoulders, stepped forward, put her right hand to her waist, raised her left hand above her head, and waving a kerchief, began to work her shoulders. Stamping out a lively rhythm, she started to sing, And tomorrow's Sunday, you're my lady, you're my ma'am. Our hours of merriment were short. Suddenly the fun came to an end as quickly as it had started. Again the sound of engines began to hum in the air and the order rang out, To your places! Kruglov walked up to Kamelev. Comrade Lieutenant, you've been ordered to head to the rear with your fighters to the reassembly point. We warmly said our goodbyes to our comrades. Kamelev said, upon parting, Don't be blue, we'll meet again. Life soon surprisingly confirmed the lieutenant's words. We indeed met again, but under very different circumstances. On Reconnaissance The German forces, having seized the city of Kingisepp, hurled fresh infantry and armour in pursuit of our retreating units, with the aim of breaking through to the Gulf of Luga and encircling the group of Soviet forces defending the city of Narva. All day long on 11 August, Soviet aviation bombed enemy concentrations near the Salka River. Large groups of aircraft from both sides were locked in constant aerial battles. More and more fresh infantry and artillery units made forced marches to reinforce us. A People's Militia Division was holding the defensive line on our right flank. Towards evening, an exchange of rifle and machine gun fire started up. At this time, a group of Ju-87 dive bombers appeared in the sky. They operated just as they had previously over the Narva River. The leader rocked his wings, the Stuka shook out into a chain, and the dive bombers went into a dive on our positions at the edge of the forest. The piercing howl of sirens rang out. We were hearing them for the first time, 
For the uninitiated, this terrifying sound was even more frightening than the whistle of a falling bomb. Just at that moment, when the men were afraid even to move a muscle, a long burst of machine gun fire cut through the air. I raised my head for a moment and immediately saw one of the diving stukas go into a spin. The pilot tried to pull out of it, but couldn't do it. With a howl and a loud explosion, it smashed into the ground on the edge of the highway. The machine gun burst seemed to wake the men up and shook them out of their daze. Rifle shots began to ring out. The word was passed down the trench line. Uncle Varsia had shot down the Yunker. It was the first time we had fired at the enemy aircraft with our rifles and machine guns. Uncle Vasya was kneeling behind his Maxim machine gun, his chestnut-coloured hair was dishevelled and his eyes were shining. Mixing his words with choice swearing, he shouted, Load it with armour-piercing, with armour-piercing. In front of us and behind us, everything seemed to be on fire. The haystacks, the woods, knocked out tanks and downed aircraft. The Germans launched their attack. Romanov and Ulyanov were firing from Degtyarev light machine guns. I was sitting in the trench, reloading empty drums for the machine guns and passing them to my comrades. Nearby, next to a shattered dugout, the soldier Kazarian was lying face down. I thought he was dead. Kruglov ran up and wanted to take the light machine gun from the fallen soldier. But as soon as the commander touched the barrel of the machine gun, Kazarian hopped to his feet. I'm guilty, comrade commander. Fear overcame me. The Fritzes have dropped a lot of bombs. Krugloff pointed at us. What do you think? Their hearts are armoured. Kazarian set his machine gun on the edge of the collapsed dugout and opened fire. A loud moan suddenly came from beyond a turn in the trench not far from me. I handed over a loaded drum and ran to give assistance. Sergeant Ukov was sitting with his back against the wall of the trench, trying with both hands to close the wound torn into his lower abdomen by a shell fragment. In a quiet voice, he asked for something to drink. I gently laid him on his back in order to bandage the wound, but as I was unfastening his belt, he died. I watched as the colour drained from his face, and as an unexpressed word solidified on his lips. Drink. The fighting continued all day. Despite repeated attacks, the enemy was unable to break through our defences and roll up the Soviet units, defending the Luga. As soon as it began to grow dark, Senor Lieutenant Kruglov ordered me to accompany him to battalion headquarters. I followed him. The evening was surprisingly tranquil. It was hard to believe that the enemy was just several hundred metres away. The Germans were apparently planning something. However, this evening they had changed their normal tactics. They didn't illuminate no man's land with flares and didn't send bursts of machine gun fire across it from time to time. How can one understand the enemy's intentions, I thought to myself, walking behind the commander. We entered Major Chistyakov's bunker. It was cramped, with a very low ceiling. The chief of staff, the commissar and an unfamiliar major were all present. As I learned later, the Major was the commander of the division's reconnaissance. The discussion was short. Chistyakov ordered Kruglov to scout the enemy in the battalion's sector. A difficult assignment, I thought. We all knew Kruglov was an experienced company commander, but he wasn't a scout. Reconnaissance was a new business for us riflemen as well. On the way back, the company commander didn't utter a single word. He was also plainly concerned about the task he had received. While we were gone, the front had come to life. Flares soared into the sky, and there was the persistent chatter of machine guns. Krugloff assembled a scout team carefully but quickly. The members had to be ready for anything and prepared for any surprise. Politruk Vasilev organised a watch over the Germans' outposts and firing positions. By midnight, everything was ready for the reconnaissance team's departure. I was among the group of twelve men selected for the mission, as was Romanov, for his excellent German language skills. It's good we're going out together, he told me as he offered me a friendly handshake. When everyone had gathered, the company commander briefly laid out the mission. I ask you to remember not to do anything without my orders. 
The scout's strengths are in concealment and decisiveness. He appears where he is not expected. But if he is discovered, he must disappear as quickly as he had appeared. Kruglov turned to me. What, a bit frightened, Pilyushin? It's my first time to go on reconnaissance, comrade commander. The polytruck pointed out to us the locations of the enemy's heavy machine guns, took our personal documents, and carefully checked our gear. We were all wearing German camouflage smocks. Good luck, he said as we left. The first to clamber out of the trench were Krugloff, Romanov, Ulyanov and I. After a few moments, the rest of the group departed to follow us. The German machine gunners were firing unceasingly. As soon as one machine gun would fall silent, another would open up. Thus, taking turns, they kept our lines under constant fire. We crawled forward without stopping. Now and then flares soared into the sky, in the light of which I soon noticed freshly constructed earthworks. They were the enemy's forward outposts, just some forty to fifty metres away. Directly in front of us, a machine gun unexpectedly began working. We froze, firmly hugging the earth. The tracer bullets grazed the blades of grass. But suddenly the Germans ceased firing. We crept forward another thirty metres. Taking cover beneath the German breastworks, we began to listen in on the Nazis' conversations. At this moment a German, who had just reloaded his machine gun which was standing in plain view, opened fire again. Shuddering on its long legs, like an enormous mosquito, the machine gun rapidly chewed through and spat out a belt of ammunition. With his ammunition now evidently exhausted, the machine gunner quickly tossed aside the empty ammunition case and set a new one in position next to the gun. Coughing, he then disappeared back into the trench. Kruglov gave a hand signal. We quickly climbed over the breastworks and dropped down into a shallow trench. We'll wait here for the machine gunner's return, the company commander whispered. Then you'll have a chance to chat with him, comrade Romanov. We need the password. We scattered to the right and left, concealing ourselves behind turns in the trench. In the depths of the enemy's defences, nothing was visible. There was just the dark outline of the forest against the backdrop of the sky. Somewhere quite close by a muffled engine was running. Apparently German tanks or armoured half-tracks were nearby. We waited impatiently for the return of the machine gunner. At last we heard footsteps. Romanov and I were standing around a corner in the trench, just a few metres from the machine gun, and waited for the German to approach. But as if to spite us, he was in no hurry. We watched as the German stopped and took a look around. He grabbed a cigarette from out of his pocket and lit it up. The flare of the lighter illuminated the fascist's whiskered face. Then he deeply stuck his hands into the pockets of his trousers and started walking in our direction. We lay low. About twenty metres from us, he suddenly stopped and looked up at a rising flare. In its light, he evidently caught sight of something in our trenches and resolutely headed for the machine gun. Reaching the turn, he bumped into the muzzle of a gun, dropped the cigarette from his mouth and instantly raised his hands. Romanov asked him, Password? The German didn't answer immediately. Kruglov disarmed him and told Romanov, Get the password, but warn him. If he's lying, we'll kill him. Romanov shoved the German away from the machine gun and threatened him with his fist. I'm warning you. If you give us the wrong password, you'll be killed. The German soldier was so frightened that he couldn't say a single word, but when he felt a dagger pressed against his chest, he suddenly blurted out in a quavering voice, I swear on my life, our password is Kugel. Where's your regiment headquarters? I don't know. Your battalion? I don't know. Where's your company commander? Here, beyond the third turn in the trench. What's that noise we're hearing? Tanks. After the brief interrogation, the German was sent back to our trenches under the escort of two of the team. After they left, Kruglov told us, If the German was speaking the truth, we'll get something done. But if he was lying, it's going to be difficult. Let's check the password anyway. We moved out towards the edge of the forest, with Romanov and Ulyanov moving in front. 
After about 50 metres, we encountered a different German with a light machine gun in the trench. Romanov shouted, Halt! Duma Kerl, the German barked in reply. Password, asked Romanov. Kugel! Romanov lowered the barrel of his submachine gun. The German walked up to use and asked, Where are you going? We're scouts, planning to pay a visit to the Russians. They've established a foothold on the other side of that brook. The German raised his hand to his helmet in acknowledgement. I wish you luck. Then he leisurely strolled past Romanov. But when he drew even with Ulyanov, he suddenly collapsed to the trench floor. Ulyanov had thrust a knife into his side. Beyond the third turn in the trench, we discovered a dugout from which conversation and laughter were coming. Here, apparently, was indeed the company commander. The German machine gunner had told us the truth. We went about another 150 metres and ran into a second heavy machine gun position. We found another machine gunner slumbering beside the gun, his back against the trench wall. I saw Romanov quickly cover the German's mouth and swing his other arm. The German didn't manage to cry out. With his second knife blow, Romanov finished him off. Just short of the forest, the trench took a sharp angle to one side. We stayed in the trench and began to observe. We saw a sentry standing next to a tank in some low underbrush. It was impossible to move into the forest without being noticed. There was only one way forward. We had to take out the sentry. Krugloff handed this assignment to Romanov. He was supposed to lead our small group towards the sentry, while Ulyanov and I followed him at a short distance, as if we were his messengers. The German didn't even hail us, he just kept softly whistling a tune. Walking up to him, Romanov asked him for a smoke. The sentry hastily pulled a box of matches from his pocket and compliantly offered it to Romanov. Can you tell me, Herr Officer, what time it is? he asked. Romanov glanced at the illuminated numbers on his watch dial. 1.45. Having smoked, Romanov handed the matches back to the sentry. At the moment, the sentry was sticking the box of matches back into his trousers with his right hand, Romanov struck his temple violently with the butt of his pistol. The sentry crumpled to the ground, and Romanov fell on top of him. Romanov covered the German's face with his chest and made sure the German's right hand stayed in the pocket. Ulyanov and I helped Romanov carry the German into the woods, where the rest of, the team was waiting for us. We took a good listen. All was quiet. About 300 metres into the woods, we discovered another tank. We could see the dim outlines of its turret and long gun barrel against the night sky. The tank crew wasn't sleeping. The driver's hatch was open and a little lamp was glowing inside the tank. The tankers were playing cards. We cautiously crept along the edge of the forest and counted eight tanks. Krugloff ordered Sergeant Major Kudryavtsev and two sappers to lie down near the tanks and keep watch on them, while he marked the tanks' positions on a map and led us towards a supply road, running through the woods in the direction of Kingisep. When we approached the road, we heard the sounds of a harmonica. We went a little further and discovered an automobile. Its doors were open and someone sitting on the running board was playing a simple tune on the harmonica. Another man was standing beside the car. A submachine gun was dangling from his neck. He was poking at something in the sandy road with the toe of his boot and whistling along with the harmonica. For several minutes, staying concealed in the trees, we watched the Germans. It seemed clear. They were waiting for the return of their commander, who was somewhere nearby. He was the one we were seeking. Suddenly to the left of us there was a scraping sound, and a panel of bright light cut through the night gloom. Two Germans dragged someone barely capable of standing through the open door of the bunker. Two more Nazis stepped out of the bunker after them. Having quickly discussed something, two Germans went back into the bunker and firmly closed the door behind them. In the darkness, we lost sight of the others. After a few seconds, through the sounds of their steps, we could determine that they were moving towards the car. Soon we caught sight of their silhouettes by the side of the road. The man, who the fascists were dragging, suddenly stood up and tried to shake off the grasp of the Germans holding him, but he couldn't remain standing. 
Falling to the ground, he tried with his hands and feet to fight off the two escorts who were ganging up on him. We heard a burst of Russian. Kill me, vermin, I won't tell you anything. My comrades will avenge my death. One of the Germans struck him on the head with something. The driver and soldier by the car rushed up to help the escorts, and the four of them hurled the Russian into the automobile. In front of our eyes, they were torturing a Soviet man. We were ready to rush the executioners and tear them to pieces. But Krugloff gave no signal. The driver started the car and the vehicle slipped away into the darkness. What? We didn't rescue one of our own, I said with clear indignation to Romanov in a whisper. On the Narva we gave one of their captured officers bread, Sidorov said between his clenched teeth, while they, the snakes, torture and abuse our people. At that moment a group of soldiers appeared on the road. They were stopped by a sentry. A change of the guard occurred. As soon as the group moved away, a new sentry was holding his submachine gun at the ready. Taking a careful look around, he then started pacing along the road. We waited to see what our commander would decide to do. Senior Lieutenant Kruglov gave a hand signal to Ulyanov and Sidorov. Carefully picking their way from tree to tree, they made their way to the side of the road and dropped into a prone position. Soon the sentry passed them on the other side of the road. Waiting several seconds, Ulyanov and Sidorov crept after him before dropping prone again. When the German returned again, they rushed him. I heard only a muffled wheeze. Kruglov ordered me and Ulyanov to follow him, while the others were to remain in position and monitor the road. Without any particular stealth, the company commander approached the bunker and kicked in the door. Two German officers were sitting behind a table. One was leaning over a map, while the other was saying something over the telephone. Kruglov shouted, Hande hoch! The officers, leaping to their feet, raised their hands and looked at us with widely opened, terrified eyes. We disarmed them and then gathered up the map and some papers. We returned to the woods in a file. Kruglov and Romanov took the advance, while Ulyanov and I followed behind with the German officers. The rest of the scout team followed us. The night had become darker. We imagined an enemy soldier behind every tree. One of the officers was constantly mumbling and shaking his head occasionally. Ulyanov whispered to me, A good catch. But how will we haul him in? The sappers joined us at the designated place. A lot of Germans passed us heading for the trench, reported Sergeant Major Kudryavtsev. The tanks are still parked where they were. We took cover in some brush close to the forward trench. Once again, the ground around was being illuminated by flares rising into the sky over no man's land. By the sounds and low conversations, one could guess that new German squads were moving up into the forward trench. I was standing next to Krugloff, and when the next flare soared into the sky, I looked at his face. It seemed even more stern than usual, and his eyes were staring into the darkness. Wrinkles creased his prominent brow. The commander was searching for a way out of a difficult situation. Suddenly his face brightened, a smile played across his lips, and he gestured for Romanov to join him. Take the uniform and cap off an officer and get dressed in them. No one knew what the commander was thinking. Romanov got dressed in the uniform of a German Hauptmann. It was almost impossible to recognise him. He looked completely different. Krugloff looked Romanov over carefully and then said, OK, go alone into the trench and call for the officer in charge. Tell him that you're searching for Russians that have infiltrated into the rear. If the officer detects something wrong, shoot him with your pistol. That will be a signal for us to come immediately to your assistance. If everything goes well, summon us. I walked over to Romanov. Petya, ask the commander to take me with you. You understand anything might happen. Krugloff allowed me to accompany Romanov and handed me his captured submachine gun. Together, we set off towards the German trench. Once we reached it, Romanov leaped into it without a second thought. I followed him into it. We wound up face to face with a German soldier. Romanov ordered him to summon the officer in charge immediately. I felt as if I was standing on a white-hot sheet of metal, not the ground. 
not even two minutes passed when we saw an officer making his way through the trench towards us. The soldier wasn't with him. The German preempted Romanov. Take over this sector of the trench, he said. Romanov saluted the officer but said, I don't need a sector. I'm conducting a special search. Russian scouts are operating somewhere behind our lines. I've been ordered to capture them when they try to return to their own lines. Get your men out of here. We must operate secretly and take the Russians alive. Just a minute, I must clarify this matter with the battalion commander. With that, the German disappeared into the darkness. Romanov whispered to me, Quickly, go get our guys. While the Germans are talking things over, the fellows can carry away the prisoners. The senior lieutenant will decide the rest. Without wasting a second in the trench, the scouts headed by Kruglov dragged the bound prisoners off through some tall grass towards our lines. At the commander's orders, the sapper Kudryavtsev remained behind with us. After some time, the Nazi officer came running up to us. They're already searching for the Russian scouts. They're asking you to come to the telephone. The German then looked over Romanov's shoulder suspiciously at me. At that moment, Romanov struck the German's head with the butt of his pistol. The officer sank to his knees. To our left, quite nearby, a machine gun began to chatter. They've detected us, the vermin, I thought. Will we ever reach our homes again? Leaping from the trench and taking cover in the tall grass, we began crawling towards the machine gun. At Romanov's signal, one grenade after another flew towards its position. The machine gun abruptly fell silent. A commotion erupted in the trenches, and we heard shouting. Wild firing started up in every direction. The bullets weren't touching us, but we couldn't remain here by the breastworks long. Dawn was quickly approaching. Suddenly a green rocket rose into the sky over our lines. Then a second and a third. They're signalling us, I thought. We had already noticed under the light of the German flares a ditch about thirty metres away from us. How were we to reach it? We weren't aware of how much time passed during our harrowing waiting. Suddenly, several heavy machine guns began working at the same time from our side. Bright lines of tracer rounds passed just over the German trench. At Romanov's signal, we began crawling quickly towards the ditch, but we hadn't managed to reach it when a burst of machine gun fire caught us. I heard a dull groan next to me. I cautiously crawled over to my comrade. It was Kudryavtsev. Grabbing the sergeant major by the right arm, I slung him over my back and began squirming through the tall grass. Bullets here and there snapped through the grass. At the end of my strength, I reached the ditch at last. I carefully laid Kudryavtsev on the grass. Sergei, Sergei, do you hear me? I asked. The sergeant major didn't respond. I pressed my ear to his chest. His heart wasn't beating. Oh, what a soldier has been killed. Glancing around, I saw Romanov crawling towards me. The machine gun fire was intensifying on both sides. It was impossible to return directly to our lines. Staying low and within the ditch, we crawled to the edge of some woods, bringing our dead. Comrade with us? It was already getting light when we finally reached our positions by an indirect route. The battalion commander's bunker, where we arrived to report on our return, was crowded. Major Chistyakov stepped around the table where he had been seated to greet us. He firmly kissed our cheeks in a fatherly fashion. Thank you, comrades, for your service. The battalion commander removed a flask from his belt and offered it to Romanov. It's from Leningrad. Saved for a special occasion. Go rest up. Romanov took the flask, but didn't leave immediately. He pointed at the German officers, who were sitting on the edge of a plank bunk. Thanks, Comrade Major, but we'd like to hear what those two have to say. Well then, stay, Chistyakov said as he reached for his flask. No, Comrade Battalion Commander, I won't give up Leningrad vodka. The bunker filled with laughter. The Major, smiling, walked back to the table. I was standing by the entrance, scanning those present for Kruglov. He wasn't there. The frightening thought flashed through my mind. Perhaps he didn't. But several minutes later, the senior lieutenant noisily entered the bunker and impulsively embraced Romanov and me. 
My friends, time won't forget what you've done. You bailed us out of a tough situation. An interrogation of the prisoners started. Turning to the German seated on his left, Major Chistyakov asked in Russian, Your name and rank? The prisoner stood up. I don't understand the Russian language, he brusquely said in German to the translator. The major extended a sheet of paper to the German. On it there were German and Russian statements written in the same handwriting. The major asked, Did you write this? The German shot a quick glance at the paper and dropped his head. The major persisted. If you don't want to speak Russian, just tell us everything in German. I am Major Adolf Schultz, the German answered in accented Russian. I am on the staff of Army Group North's commander. Romanov leaned over to me and whispered, Quite a catch. Why were you visiting the front lines? I was accompanying a battalion. Where will it be operating and who is its commander? Schultz pointed at the other German officer. He is Hauptmann Heinrich Kurz. The battalion will be operating on your sector. Romanov rose from behind the table, walked directly up to the German, and asked him in a menacing voice, Just what were you doing with that Russian in the bunker? The officer's face went pale. It wasn't me. It wasn't Kurtz or I. The man was a Russian pilot who'd been shot down over our territory. His name? The Russian didn't answer a single question. We glared with hatred at the long face of Adolf Schultz, at his narrow forehead and small, sharp eyes. Kruglov picked up a map case from the table, and walking over to the German he asked, Whose map case is this? Adolf Schultz reached for the map case. It's mine, he said. But Krugloff didn't give him the case. Instead, he slowly opened it and withdrew from it three pairs of women's silk stockings, a pendant on a long gold chain and a gold watch. Then he asked, You prepared a parcel for someone, Mr. Nazi? The officer remained sullenly silent, slowly fingering the buttons on his tunic. As the prisoners were being led out of the bunker, Major Chistyakov unexpectedly stopped them with a question. One minute? I want to clarify one thing. The Major walked over to Adolf Schultz with a sheet of paper and asked him, Can you explain to me what these dates mean? With that, he started reading from the sheet. 1st of August, King Isep. 3rd of August, Volosovo. 5th of August, Ropsha. 7th of August, Krasnoye Selo. 9th of August, Uritsk. 15th of August, Leningrad. It's the Führer's directive. It indicates the objectives and the dates by which we should take them, the German replied. Through clenched teeth, Major Chistyakov shot back. You're late, sir. After all, on the Soviet calendar, today is already the 13th. They took the prisoners away to the regiment headquarters. We surrounded the battalion commander. He crumpled the sheet of paper and tossed it to the floor and then pronounced grimly, they'll never set foot in Leningrad.